Today is Friday, April 10th, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Steve Miller in Washington. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been moved out of the ICU. His culture minister said Thursday he was, quote, stable, improving, sat up and engaged with medical staff. Plus, early voting begins in South Korea. Face masks, mandatory, plus plastic gloves, and sanitize before you cast your vote. And ways of coping with anxiety in the age of COVID-19. Those stories and more are next. It's been 100 days since the World Health Organization was first notified about the novel coronavirus. So, what do we know at the onset, and what knowledge have we since gained? For that, I spoke to Dr. David Weber, a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of North Carolina here in the U.S. We knew very quickly it was the coronavirus. In addition, we had the 1918 flu pandemic help guide us in some of these issues. So very quickly, we knew a number of things about the this virus. We knew that it would be droplet and direct contact transmitted, meaning within six feet and touching and likely to be indirect to contact. We knew that coronaviruses survived on uh, inanimate surfaces for hours to days. But we also knew that uh, alcohol as an antiseptic was active against this virus and standard disinfectants uh, were quite active against this uh, virus as well. Uh, we knew uh, very quickly that it came from bats as the ultimate reservoir. Uh, we also knew, of course, that uh, we did not have a vaccine and that there were no uh, proven effective uh, treatments for uh, this uh, this virus. We knew the symptoms would be predominantly uh, uh, respiratory. Uh, what did we learn over uh, the next uh, period of uh, time? Well, we uh, have learned that the infectivity of this virus is similar to influenza, maybe a little bit higher. Uh, we knew from SARS and MERS that there were so-called super spreaders, meaning infecting more than 10 people. We knew from SARS that this uh, virus, even without uh, any therapies or vaccines, uh, could be contained uh, to some extent uh, by physical distancing, a term we prefer to social distancing. What else have we learned recently? Well, just uh, in the last uh, month or so, we've learned that a substantial number of people uh, may become asymptomatically uh, infected. Uh, we believe uh, that some of those asymptomatic infections can transmit. We also know a number of people can be pre-symptomatic transmission. So what don't we know and what do we still need to learn? First of all, we don't have a vaccine and it probably won't have one for 12 months uh, because one will have to be developed and two testing a vaccine takes considerable time. We do know that there are a number of uh, drugs, potential therapeutic drugs, that are active on the test tube or animals. Multiple clinical trials are underway, but we don't know yet which, if any, of these drugs uh, will be useful in combating COVID. While we think both pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission may be possible, we don't know how frequently that occurs. We don't yet know uh, how likely we are to see second and third and fourth waves of this virus in the future. Uh, we still are just beginning to learn more about the risk factors for severe disease, certainly older age, particularly over 70 and then over 80 is a major risk factor. Underlying diseases, heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease are risk factors as well. But we haven't quite determined exactly the interaction of all these risk factors or how additive they are. And then some other risk factors uh, such as uh, uh, asthma, uh, how impactful uh, that is. We still need to determine uh, what the impact uh, is on pregnant women. Uh, certainly, if a pregnant woman becomes severely ill, that has severe detrimental effects in both the woman and the fetus. But other issues about uh, uh, are there potential small amounts of transmission through uh, breast milk or intrauterine to uh, uh, children. And finally, uh, obviously, uh, the pandemic is now worldwide and we're using physical distancing. Uh, we still have to determine how long that physical distancing needs to be maintained and what the triggers are for allowing people to stop physical distancing. 
go back to working, revive our economies. In terms of testing, U.S. President Donald Trump said that it was very unlikely that every American would be given a COVID-19 test. Do you need it? No. Is it a nice thing to do? Yes. Uh, We're talking about 325 million people, uh, and that's not going to happen, as you can imagine. And no, it would never happen with anyone else either. Other countries do it, but they do it in a limited form. We'll probably be the leader of the pack. So the question I have for you is, how prevalent should testing be? So there are two uh, types of tests. We have PCR tests that actually look for virus. And those are important that we have enough testing capacity uh, to test all of those who have symptoms. Uh, so we know who's ill, who's not, particularly when we start beginning to develop therapies. And there are already many clinical trials, and obviously you need to test them to see if they're infected uh, to put them into an appropriate clinical trial. And those tests need to be more widely available so that every person who has symptoms uh, could be uh, could be tested. Certainly anybody who's sick enough to have to come into a healthcare facility, either as an outpatient or inpatient, uh, we need to be able to test. Similarly, we need to have enough test capability uh, for when we have infection in closed populations, cruise ship, nursing homes, college dorms, hotels, we need to be able to test all the individuals there to learn who's infected, who's not uh, not currently infected. As a separate issue are the serologic tests, which don't measure actual virus, but measure the antibody's response to the virus. And those are just coming on board now. And those really are most useful, not for acute diagnosis, but to determine the factors that you've mentioned, what percentage of the population has been infected? Has it affected uh, uh, differentially, as we now believe, uh, African-Americans and other minorities? How about immunocompromised patients? Has it been more, and there have been higher attack rates in urban versus uh, uh, suburban or rural areas? What about the differences in age? And for the serologic tests, no, we don't have to test every single American. Much like the Gallup poll, we need to test enough people randomly chosen from the population and from uh, substantial subpopulations such as uh, minorities, uh, women and men, people with underlying disease, a variety of ages, to be able to statistically be able to look at those groups. So that number will not be in the millions. It will be in the thousands to uh, potentially uh, uh, over 10,000 people. That can be determined statistically by epidemiologists and statisticians. That was Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of North Carolina, Dr. David Weber. More than 1.6 million people have contracted the disease, and that is according to a Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's health is improving, and he's been moved out of the intensive care unit where he continues to be treated for COVID-19. On the government's plate, in his absence, a review of lockdown measures and a colossal overdraft. Reuters' Lucy Fielder has that story. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is getting better in intensive care, where he is battling COVID-19. His culture minister said Thursday he was, quote, stable, improving, sat up and engaged with medical staff. The 55-year-old was admitted to hospital on Sunday and has spent three nights in emergency care but he has not been put on a ventilator. His stand-in, Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab, faces two main challenges. One is reviewing Britain's stringent lockdown at an emergency COBRA meeting. No decision was expected Thursday, but the Mayor of London and other senior officials say the measures will stay in place. As Britain enters what scientists say is the deadliest phase of the outbreak, with deaths expected to rise over the coming Easter weekend. The head of Britain's National Health Service, among many, saying social distancing must go on, though the number of new infections and hospital admissions may be starting to flatten. Hopes of the coronavirus crisis nearing a peak boosted Britain's stock markets. Also on the government's plate, how to finance a vast increase in spending to support a shuttered economy. The world's fifth largest economy is facing what could be the worst hit since World War II. The Bank of England has agreed to expand the government's overdraft, temporarily financing government borrowing if the funds can't be raised on the debt market. The last time that happened was during the financial crisis of 2008. The government has made historic spending and tax cut pledges to try to shield companies and workers from what could be the biggest downturn in more than a century, ramping up borrowing plans by tens of billions of pounds. 
UK hospital deaths from COVID-19 rose a daily record of 938 to more than 7,000 as of two days ago. That was Reuters reporter Lucy Fielder.